Hi guys, today we're going to go through neutralisation and the pH scale. So you've been looking at a lot of reactions that involve acids, um, but we're going to be focusing on the neutralisation reaction, which is between acids and alkalis. So this is something you're all very familiar with from key stage 3, um, a pH scale. Uh, we've got some examples of acids and alkalis and obviously our neutral solution which is water. So um, a really strong acid would be something like hydrochloric acid um, and as we move along the scale we can see uh, weaker acids like uh, lemon juice, orange juice, um, rainwater, so acid rain. Um, it's quite a weak acid and as we move past pH 7 we've got our weak alkalis like baking soda but as we move up the scale we we have stronger alkalis uh, things like oven cleaner bleach etc now whenever you dissolve a substance in water you form what we call an aqueous solution um, which we know we use the state symbol aq when we write out chemical reactions um, now if you've got an acid uh, being dissolved in water, you form an acidic solution. So those solutions have a pH of less than 7. Um, and what actually happens when acid particles dissolve in water is that they release hydrogen ions in the solution. And that's actually those hydrogen ions is what makes the solution acidic. Um, so if you remember back from our previous videos when we were looking at um, the ions that make up hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid. We said that the thing that they all have in common is that they all contain hydrogen ions. Now, if we look at um, alkalis, when they are dissolved in water, they release hydroxide ions, which are OH minus ions. Now, those ions make the solution alkaline and um, alkaline solutions have a pH greater than 7 and we'll be looking at some examples now so we know this from the previous video acids plus alkalis make salt and water this is a uh, neutralization reaction because the products are neutral they have a pH of 7 now during this reaction the hydrogen ions from the acid react with the hydroxide ions from the alkali and water is formed as a result now the reason we say that water is neutral and it's not acidic and it's not alkaline is because um, in water the concentration of hydrogen ions equals the concentration of hydroxide ions so it's neither alkaline or acidic okay so what happens when hydrogen uh, chloride gas is dissolved in water um, well we know that hydrogen ions are released in the solution making it acidic that's one of the rules um, that we've looked at so what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and have a go at writing the ionic equation that shows us um, specifically what happens to hydrogen chloride when dissolved in water so you're writing the ionic equation, you're showing the ions that are formed. So pause the video and have a go. Right, this is what you should have got. So hydrogen chloride is actually a gas before it's dissolved in water. So just check your state symbols. And we know that uh, the hydrogen chloride uh, releases hydrogen ions and chloride ions into the solution. Let's do the same for this alkali, sodium hydroxide. What happens when it dissolves in water? So we know that obviously the solution will be alkaline because hydroxide ions are formed. So just pause the video and have a go. Okay, and this is what you should have got. So just bearing in mind sodium hydroxide uh, before it's dissolved is solid. Um, when that's dissolved in water, we obviously form an aqueous solution that contains sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Okay, now 
how do we measure acidity or alkalinity? There's actually three ways that we can um, measure if something's alkaline um, or acidic and um, they have advantages and disadvantages. So the first one's quite a straightforward test, um, litmus paper. So um, the two types of litmus paper that you need to know about are red litmus paper and blue litmus paper. And essentially all you do is you, um, you dip them into your solution and the colour change indicates if it's um, acidic or alkaline. So um, if you've got blue litmus paper, blue litmus paper changes um, colour, it changes to red um, when put inside an acid, but it doesn't change colour when um, placed inside an alkali. If you've got red litmus paper, it only changes colour in alkali. So when you put that in acid, it doesn't change colour. But when you put it in an alkali, it changes to blue. Now, the litmus paper just states if it's acid or alkali. It doesn't indicate pH. Um, so we could, if you want to know the specific pH, you could use universal indicators. So universal indicators are a mixture of indicators or dyes that show a variety of colour changes that correlate to the pH scale. And so when you're using universal indicator, you usually have a pH chart. And from that, you can determine um, the pH of the solution. So obviously, uh, universal indicator is obviously going to be more accurate uh, than our litmus paper. Now, we could go even more accurate and use a pH probe or sensor, um, which essentially all you do is you place the probe in your solution and on the screen it gives a reading of um, pH. Um, and obviously that's going to give us an even more accurate reading than our universal indicator because the results are usually within two decimal places and um, this is especially useful when you're doing experiments that in which the pH changes over time so um, a, a titration is a really good example um, if you want to get accurate readings of, of the change in pH over time right the pH scale so this is a slightly more complicated scale to what you're used to. Um, so pH um, essentially tells us the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. Um, another name for pH is the power of hydrogen scale. Um, essentially it indicates that or it tells us that pH is calculated by uh, the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. So um, essentially the lower the pH or the more acidic a solution, the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions. Um, it actually uses a logarithmic scale. So uh, for example, let's say we have a solution um, that has a pH of six, so seawater and then compared that to our lemon juice. Well, if we look on the scale, um, the lemon juice will have 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, so 10 to the power of four, uh, more hydrogen ions than seawater. Um, and it, the principle works the same um, for for bases or alkalis too. Um, essentially, bases have a significantly lower concentration of hydrogen ions than hydroxide ions. And as you move along the scale for bases, the concentration of hydroxide also would increase. So what I want you to do is I want you to use that idea of... Um, for every pH uh, increase, the concentration of hydrogen ions decreases by 10. That rule I want you to use to have a go at these questions. So if you pause the video now and have a go at these questions.
OK, so what type of scale is used for pH? We just said that was a logarithmic scale. Each increase in pH of 1 equates to a decrease of 10 times the concentration of hydrogen ions. Basically, for every increase in pH, the concentration of hydrogen ions decreases by 10. Um, an acid uh, with a pH of 1 has 100 times more um, hydrogen ions than an acid of pH 3, or 10 to the power of 2. Um, an acid that has a pH of 2 has 10 times more the concentration uh, of hydrogen ions of an acid of pH 3. An acid of pH 6 has a thousand times more hydrogen ions than an alkali with a pH of 9. An acid of pH 4 has a thousand times less hydrogen ions than an acid with pH 1. Um, what is the pH of a solution with a hydrogen concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 5? That would be pH 5 and pH 2 if a hydrogen ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 2. So as long as you remember that principle, um, you would be able to uh, answer questions that link pH and concentration of hydrogen ions. OK, the last thing I want you to do is have a go at these questions. I would say give yourself maybe about 10 to 15 minutes to have a go at these questions. Uh, so you're going to have to pause the video and then um, the answers will appear on the next slide. OK, so assuming you've answered all the questions, let's quickly go through them. So uh, what distinguishes alkalis from other bases? So remember um, that bases split into two groups, soluble and insoluble. So we've got insoluble uh, bases like metal, metal oxides, metal carbonates, and then you've got your soluble bases or alkalis, things like metal hydroxides. Um, all alkalis form hydroxide ions in water. Uh, then we had to draw the um, ionic equation for uh, dissociation of potassium hydroxide. That is an alkali. Uh, so when dissolved in water, it forms hydroxide ions and a positive uh, potassium ion. Um, acids all produce hydrogen ions for question 2a. Uh, in solution. Uh, then we had a, a new acid, hydrobromic acid, HBr, very, very similar uh, bonding and structure to hydrogen chloride um, or hydrochloric acid. So essentially hydrogen ions and bromine ions are formed. If you weren't sure if hydrogen bromide is aqueous uh, or in a gas before it was um, bonded that that's fine because uh, that's not very clear in the question um, in terms of your state symbols okay question number three how could you use universal indicator um, as a way of distinguishing between distilled water sodium hydroxide solution and ethanoic acid so we've obviously got a neutral solution an alkaline solution and an acidic solution um, so you would be able to distinguish them by their, their pH. Um, so water is neutral, has a pH of 7. Sodium hydroxide, a pH greater than 7 because it's alkaline and ethanoic acid less than 7. Uh, you could have given a suggestion as well, a sensible suggestion. Sodium hydroxide is a very strong alkaline uh, solution, but ethanoic acid not that strong. Um, the next lesson we'll be looking at um, strong and weak acids. Um, so you'll be more familiar with ethanoic acid. Okay, question four. Describe the way the pH changes when a strong acid is added slowly to a strong alkali. So actually what I've got here on the next slide 
this is what we call a pH curve. And what you can see is uh, initially our solution was an alkaline. So in the, on your y-axis, you've got the pH of the mixture and it's about 12.5. That tells us it's quite a strong alkaline solution. On your x-axis, you've got volume of acid added. So we can see that over time, uh, the pH um, does change. Um, and initially it remains quite high um, and when around 25 centimeters cubed of acid is added we form a neutral solution now beyond um, that as the acid uh, continues to be added to the solution um, in the beaker we can see that the ph becomes lower and lower i.e more and more acidic um, and that just is because all of our um, alkaline particles have probably reacted with the acid and formed um, water initially and now we've just got excess um, acid particles now you've done something very similar to this when we did the titration required practical uh, we didn't measure uh, ph as we did it but we did identify the point at which the solution became neutral using um, a color change um, but for this uh, experiment they, they probably would have used a ph sensor uh, attached to a data logger and that would have recorded the ph over time uh, during this experiment so let's just check you out for question four so it starts high uh, remains constant and um, when the alkali is neutral, uh, neutralized, um, the pH begins to fall very rapidly and continues to fall as more acid is added. So that was just a, a graph to illustrate that change. Um, OK, last question. Advantages and disadvantages of using universal indicator paper or a pH sensor. So we, we, we talked about uh, the litmus paper. Um, the principle essentially is the same. So the paper will only give you like a rough estimate and it's just a quick test that tells us this, if it's acid or alkaline. So this could be quite useful, um, for example, in a lab. If, for example, we've got an unlabeled bottle, sometimes that's happened at school and the technician needs to quickly check if it's an acid or alkali. Um, and so they, they'll just put some litmus paper in. Um, so it's useful in that sense, but obviously nowhere near as accurate as our pH sensor. Um, and that gives the most accurate reading, but obviously quite expensive, time consuming, etc. Um, with the universal indicator, and you guys uh, must have seen this in school yourself when you've when you've used it, is it also comes down to your judgment. So um, for example, particularly when the colours can kind of overlap a little bit, um, you know, is it a pH 5, is it a 6, is it a 4? Um, so sometimes it's left to your own judgment, which um, can then result in your um, test being inaccurate. Right, so what I'd like you to do now is just award yourself uh, the correct marks. Um, and we're almost finished with this topic just one more lesson which is about strong and weak acids